a little bit about where the journey started? Well, I'm actually, uh, I do a lot of sports photography, primarily rugby um, for Methodist College. And uh, through that, I had met Cheryl, who is the face of the, the exhibition. And she, um, <clears throat> uh, last year, during COVID, she, um, because her son, who had gone through the year as Methody captain, uh, first 15 captain, didn't get to play thanks to, to COVID. I think they maybe got one, one match. She asked me if, um, if I would put together a collage of, of images for Luke and his best friend, also called Luke, also played on the same team, and <clears throat> uh, to give to him on his 18th birthday. So I said, uh, yes, of course. Um, and I think um, what Cheryl had in mind was a couple of photographs um, sort of stuck together in some Photoshop way. But actually, I, put, I decided that uh, look deserved, or the two looks deserved a lot 
a lot more. So I spent a lot of time putting them all together and came up with a lovely collage for each of them. Got it mounted as an 18 year old uh, young man would want and, and framed. Uh, but I had to go off to uh, Spain um, and so didn't get to see the finished product and Cheryl uh, had to go in and pick it up. And <clears throat> so I was really keen to know what she thought of it and what in, in particular Luke had thought of, the, thought of it. And she messaged me one day on his, on his 18th birthday to say, Jennifer, you have no idea the impact of that image. Luke was in tears. And it just, you know, it just meant so much because he hadn't got to play, etc. Um, that year. And she said, and it meant even more because today I had to tell, look, that um, my cancer was back. And this time it wasn't going to go away. And because of an experience that I had had, uh, the year before with a very good uh, friend whose who's partner uh, very sadly died of, of cancer and was taken too early. Um, and I, I can remember um, as he was coming uh, quite close to the uh, end, I, there was something within me that made me want to take that a photograph of him. But I knew that by saying, would you mind if I took your photograph? Um, it, I knew he would say yes because of the type of person that he was, but I also knew that by saying that to him, it was like an acknowledgement that I know you're not going to be here in, in a couple of weeks' time. You know, can I have some sort of um, memory or souvenir, for want of a better word? Obviously, that's not what I meant, but that's what was going through my mind. And I always regretted not saying to him, asking for his permission to take his, his portrait. And so whenever Cheryl told me that news, I'm, I thought, my goodness, you know, I, I can actually maybe do something for this lovely family. Um, and, but yet I didn't know how to word it. I didn't know whether, it was, how it was, you know, to, to say, I didn't, so I messaged, I just took the bull by the horn, sitting over, I can remember it as well, sitting at the, the table over in, uh, uh, in Spain and just said, right, I'm just going to do this. I'm going to make the offer. So I said, look, honestly, just ignore this if this is not appropriate. I don't even know if it is or not. But if you would like me to take some photographs of you and the boys and Kevin, then please just say the word. And if this is not appropriate, you don't even have to answer. So um, the reply came back like that. And it was Charles saying, oh, Jennifer, I would love to. Well, no sooner had I got back in Belfast when the uh, call came or the text came, uh, Jennifer, would it be possible to take some photographs on Monday? Because uh, I would love some before I start looking ill. And that in itself was a shock to me. but. Um, so I offered to get them into the, the studio that I have access to, to and we had a lovely session. I kept it relaxed and everything, but it was a very, very emotional session. And basically it started from, from there. Um, at an, a later time, I said to uh, Gerald, do you fancy going out for a walk? It was uh, sort of May-June time. Do you fancy going out for a walk? Um, I'll bring the camera with us and we can just keep it all relaxed. And she said, yeah, I'd love that. So I had her lying in, the, the, uh, in amongst the, the wildflowers and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But I got a couple of nice shots and I think one of them just sort of hit uh, the something, right. You saw something that captured, you saw something in that photograph. And well, so, so did Cheryl. Cheryl saw something yes. of her. This was a stage whenever Cheryl had, uh, was going through uh, chemotherapy and had lost her hair. And uh, I asked her if she wouldn't mind if she would mind taking the, the her headscarf off, and she said, "Yeah, yeah, no problem." And um, so it's actually the first time I think that I probably photographed anybody uh -huh. like that. And uh, but it, it 
it was just very relaxed and that's the way we and I'd, you know the light was pretty harsh at times and it was tricky but we had a bit of fun and but it was one of the photographs that I, I showed to Cheryl later that I think uh, struck a chord with her and as a result then she contacted me and said uh, Jennifer would you consider photographing me to the inevitable end of my uh, of my cancer journey. I, of course, I knew what that meant. I knew that that wasn't going to be easy. But for me, I regarded it as a privilege um, to be asked to do something like that, to be trusted. And so it kind of just went from, from there. Then um, a Cheryl came round to the house. I said, look, I need to know more about what you've been through. I need to know more about um, your, your journey and where the, the limits are. Because at that stage, I didn't even know whether, um, you know, Cheryl was going to be happy with me photographing her mastectomy. And, and I was kind of fumbling around it, and she just said to me, "You want to know if I can photograph your uh, my if you can photograph my uh -huh. mastectomy?" And I said, "Yes, thanks for making that easy." And she said, "Yes, of course. There aren't any limits." So um, then, when we got into the studio next day, and I can remember us going down to the cafe in between shot um, shooting, and and I said. Cheryl, what you were telling me yesterday, do you mind going through it all again? Because all I could remember from the day before were these, um, you know, uh, a tale of missed opportunities, of lack of choice as to what breast surgery that she, would, she was able to have, of um, treatment and care or, or lack of care that was to me, just seemed to be, my goodness, this is just awful. But also what, what struck me most was the realisation that I myself had no idea that there was such a difference between uh, primary breast cancer and secondary breast cancer. And I just... Um, just soaked it all in and in fact I had to write it I have it all in my notes we just t I tabulated and 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 I was saying and and then what I, then what it was just one thing after another that I thought this shouldn't be mm -hmm. and but to hear that the the services that are available to women who have primary breast cancer are not available to women who have secondary breast cancer and once they're diagnosed, it's pretty much on your way, dear. You know, we can't cure you. So it's, you know, it's as if all humanity has, is, is lost at that point. And um, so it, that very day, going back in the car, we were together in the car, and uh, Cheryl was telling me about her, um, that she had connected with a couple of other um, women almost I think by chance they were actually connecting they were in the same building having and they were, they were at appointments they were in appointments purely in random. the same building it yeah. was purely by chance and they managed to connect through actually liking a post in, uh, of a support group in Scotland realizing they were both at the same location and that was for, to me told a huge story about the total lack of support. No, they've no one to talk to. They've nobody, no secondary uh, breast care, um, breast cancer nurses. Um, so, it just, I just said, look, you need. It sounds like we need need to raise awareness because mm -hmm. when even they talk to people, uh, they know and they say, oh, I've got breast, a secondary breast cancer. Um, you know, people will say, oh, well, when does your treatment finish? You know, because there's no realisation that primary, uh, that secondary breast cancer treatment never finishes until they run out of treatment options. And 
for me, having experienced illness in, in my past and, and wishing that people were more um, educated, for want of a better and, word. And about, compassionate. And compassionate. Yes. I, I just said, well, look, I, I think I have something in the camera today of, of you, which turned out to be the... The, the invitation the face of the invitation and and it was inevitable i think that that's and i i saw something special in the photograph that i took that day uh and i was up a, i was up a set of ladders looking down and actually i think uh Char was more um at risk that day <laughs> than she had been <laughs> think, uh -huh. because my sense of balance isn't great anyway um but you made a promise that day i did i made a I made a promise that um, well, I, I said to Cheryl, look, make the offer to, um, because by this stage they now, they had 12 women in their, in their group, their little support network. And um, so I said, look, make the offer. I will offer to photograph these women and do, um, find some way of doing an exhibition. And, um, very soon, a couple of weeks later, Cheryl had me in amongst a group of these women. Um, there was maybe eight or ten around the table. By this stage, the group had grown to um, uh, to 31. And, and there's a significance of that number, 31? There are 31 women in the UK die every day, isn't that right, of secondary breast cancer. And the simple fact is that the women who die of secondary breast cancer do not become a, statistics, a stati statistic here in Northern Ireland in the healthcare system until, until they, die. they die. And that, to me, spoke volumes. But anyway, Cheryl had me sitting in front of, uh, in amongst these group of young women, youngest 30, at the, um, youngest around the table that night, I think was like 37 and the oldest, so I'm not going to point you out, <laughs> no, Anne. <I'm. laughs> <laughs> all youngsters. They're, all right, they're all they're young, <laughs> they're all young. Uh -huh. But, you know... Um, and 60 is the new 50. Well, yeah, yes. yes, I know. So, you know, I just couldn't believe that I was amongst this group of women, all with the same diagnosis, all walking the same path, well, no, walking to the same end result, every one of them along different paths, but the same result was mm -hmm. at the end. And, and you yeah. also found as well, Jennifer, that when you listened to them, which mm -hmm. was really, really important, mm -hmm. that you were horrified mm -hmm. and shocked, but that motivated you even more to make a commitment that, mm -hmm. that you were going to have an exhibition. That's it, yeah. I mean, the thing about it is that if you hear a story, a negative story, one time, um, you can excuse it as a bad experience. Uh, that maybe that oh dear that poor girl and that has come across a bad doctor or or a, an in, a, a doctor without compassion or or whatever but i have now uh, for this exhibition i've photographed six, 16 i have now photographed 19 women in the same situation and i have listened to every every one of them yeah. have had um intimate encounters and I mean uh, in the studio to in order to get the best out of the whole experience talking to them beforehand and I've heard the same thing over and over and over again to the point that it just made me angry that because what these women are going through it just shouldn't be the lack of compassion, the lack of um, empathy that's shown, even whenever they're being given their diagnosis, is different. Mm -hmm. And so I, I made a promise that I would enable their bodies to be seen. And I, I, I th my feeling was the way that needed to be done was that they would be uh, fairly hard hitting mm -hmm. raw images and I didn't promise and I promised not to make anybody look yes, younger because, because you were you were you were yeah. committed to doing this but you didn't want a calendar no there was, there was no <laughs> it was it, there was no laughing matter here and no. this was really to be in your face but dignified a dignified sensitive raw but very very powerful and obviously um and if the women uh agreed 
to, to let me do that. Uh, and I promised to, you know, not to make anybody or encourage anybody to do or to show anything that they didn't want to. Um, that, then, I would in, that I would ensure that their voices be heard because, mm -hmm. oh my goodness, do they deserve mm -hmm. to and be it, heard. And I suppose, Jennifer, you had said as well in the launch night, which was a fantastic, yep. mm -hmm. a fantastic celebration of all of the ladies. And you'll get a chance to see the exhibition, you know, yep. as you say, mm -hmm. 16 ladies, mm -hmm. 32 portraits, 16 of which you see ladies in their in their day-to-day mm -hmm. -day life and 16 as, as they are, mm -hmm. as they're bearing their scars. The interesting thing, I was going, going back over our WhatsApp group, and there have been many WhatsApp groups since, as you can imagine. I think Cheryl and Valerie and um, uh, Julie and all will testify. They, they, they've grown and grown mm -hmm. and grown. We have to be careful what we've put in each WhatsApp group. But I, I always mm -hmm. remember Julia yes. Darcy introducing me to Jennifer, and, I, and it was at the end of October, and you had sent me Jennifer's number and you explained the, the context. So I ran Jennifer. We set up a WhatsApp group between the three of us. You then sent me one or two of the images. And it was like, I don't know whether you've ever seen the film, Jerry Maguire. She had me at hello. And it has been a relationship that has grown from strength to strength since. It has been, as we know, a tsunami of emotions. One of the first things I remember, Jennifer, you saying was... Um, you know, you, the dignity in which you want to capture. And you talked about the emotions. And my concern was in supporting lots of artists and as an artist myself, and also somebody that's been through a cancer journey with her own mother and, and my own, that the emotional impact for, for the journey on the ladies themselves, but the emotional impact on you. Mm -hmm. And I mean, none of us are health professionals. You know, we're just women supporting women. And I know there are lots of men there and families that are supporting as well. But I'm also very, very conscious that there are lots of the ladies who would have um, confided in their conversations about things they didn't want to say in front of their families. They wanted to be strong. Mm -hmm. They wanted to be resilient. And they wanted to support their families in their journey. And that's, that's often what happens. Mm -hmm. In your compassion, Jennifer, and that was so, so evident. Our first meeting was in graffiti on the Armour Road. Julia and Jennifer and I met. Um, I think it was, that was the beginning of, of November and we were on a mission and I don't think, I think uh, uh, Debbie can testify to this, we were like there was no stopping us um, in terms of our determination and I suppose really my commitment and promise to you and Julia was to support you, mm -hmm. you as, as an artist to get the best possible place for the exhibition to ensure that you felt supported as a as a as an artist but also as a, as a woman and also as somebody that you mentioned as well jennifer that sometimes didn't feel heard from the medical profession mm -hmm. didn't feel that that you were listened to mm -hmm. didn't fe felt because of a misdiagnosis mm -hmm. that you felt that um you needed to speak up so you were providing an opportunity perhaps for yourself and for all of us you, you've referenced mothers and sisters and mm -hmm. family extended family but the importance of having a voice mm -hmm. So that not just the health profession, but the politicians. And it's really poignant that today is the day to vote. And if you haven't voted, vote before the end of the day and make sure you make a, 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 an informed choice. Mm. But one of the things that you mentioned as well, Jennifer, was that in this journey, that you were so protective, mm -hmm. so diligent, your anger was actually your energy that drove you. Mm -hmm. And one of the, the um, as I witnessed in, in meeting with the ladies and the conversations, we were very keen that we wanted to make sure that the ladies' voices were heard mm -hmm. and that they were authentic voices. Mm -hmm. And you'll, you'll see that upstairs because as part of the exhibition, Jennifer's exhibition, to complement the image, images, there are a series of testimonials and conversations from the ladies themselves that are authentic and genuine, not scripted, genuine mm -hmm. conversations of how people were feeling about the system. And as you've testified already, it wasn't just one, one or two, no. you know, you'll see the commonalities. Yep. Mm -hmm. So Jennifer, in relation then to the, the safe sanctuary that you set up in your mm -hmm. studio, and I would have witnessed that, you met the ladies, mm -hmm. you built up a relationship with the ladies, obviously, and it's a testament to you as well of the, the, the trust that you set up. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about how you created the ambience mm -hmm. and the, the safe sanctuary in order to get the ladies to, to actually contribute to this exhibition? Yep. Um, well, first of all, uh, you know, I, I promised that uh, that night that I met them all at, at Rainey's house that I wouldn't make anybody do 
uh, or encourage anybody to do what they weren't comfortable mm -hmm. doing. And I knew that getting a couple under, you know, in the bag, as it were, uh -huh. um, and them feeding back uh, to the others, look, it really wasn't that bad and maybe even enjoyed it just a little bit. Mm -hmm. But um, so that was really important. But the way I did it with them all is that I arranged to meet them in the little bistro um, on the ground floor and we started with a cup of coffee and basically I asked each of them to tell me their story and what was pouring out sometimes you know actually one of my first responses was I wish I had the courage to ask them if I could record this and just set the iPhone down on, on the, the table and record mm -hmm. it because it was it was so organic and it was so but um, and it was one of the reasons then why I was so keen to record those interviews with me talking to them mm -hmm. uh, on on my own. But we maybe spent an hour um, at, in, in the coffee shop and then went up to the the um, up to the, the studio. And the studio, every time that I had a, sh a shoot at, at the studio, it was totally uh, just one on one. Um, nobody else, nobody else there. If, there was one night, one day where we had a couple of them in the studio. And that was, the, that was when the penny dropped. You know, this didn't work today, and it was because I didn't have that and intimacy. You told me that because yeah. you, we were we were in conversation mm -hmm. about how things were going and mm -hmm. checking in and how things were going, and you know that actually it did interrupt. Yes, it did. You know, the, the um, I mean, yes, they were having a good time. The dialogue, the dialogue actually between the camera yeah. and the lens and the and because the way you know, I I'm. I'm not, I have no formal way of working as such. Um, <clears throat> but what, what I do is, what I did, and what I will continue to do with all this kind of portraiture photography, is to start the dialogue outside the studio, getting to know the person, getting a feel as to how um, they might um, Maybe, maybe be more self-conscious or whether they're more outgoing and gregarious, for example. Um, <clears throat> and, and then continue the conversation. And we talked about everything. Mm -hmm. We laughed. There were tears. There was... Anger? Yes, frustration? There was but dismay. always chat. And what I do in the studio, um, especially, you know, um, I've worked with professional models and they know exactly what to do and uh, what way to move. But this was just something so entirely different that my aim was to capture the physical outside, but to show something from within. Mm -hmm. And I needed each of their stories to, to be different because mm -hmm. each of their stories are different. Mm -hmm. But as you said, the destination, it's, you know, it has not been same. supported. Yeah, yeah. And, and one of the things that you'll see when you go up to see the exhibition as well, there is, a, you, you know, how the exhibition is laid out, how it's been supported by Belfast Exposed here. You know, they, it, it is an immersive experience. Mm -hmm. When you look at the images, you know, and, and how the ladies, their, their, their interests are reflected in some mm -hmm. of the photographs. Mm -hmm. But one thing that is consistent, that you have captured the energy, the life and the spirit mm -hmm. of each of those ladies. And the other thing is as well is that you sta you're standing face to face and there but to the grace of God go any one of us. Mm. And and while the, the, the exhibition is very much obviously because they're, they're ladies, mm -hmm. that's not to say it doesn't happen, you know, in terms of the, ma the man's world. But in this particular context, the, the whole conversation as well around the, the title, and that yeah. was something that we all we all kind of looked yep. at. Mm -hmm. And and again, back to this idea of authenticity, mm -hmm. nothing that was staged, nothing that was seen to be um, something that anybody felt that they were pushed into right. in mm -hmm. such a way that um, it was absolutely real. And I know mm -hmm. that when we um, brought Paul Marshall on board, and Paul's a good friend, and I would work with Paul before, we were very keen that, that, that you know, to have Jennifer photographing anyone, you know, any one of us, uh, you know, there's huge trust in, mm -hmm. in taking a photograph. There's a, you're burning your heart and your soul. Mm -hmm. But when then you're talking about it, and you have another person in the studio, mm -hmm. and up until then, was it just you and, mm -hmm. and the ladies themselves separately? 
then to bring someone else into the room and, and particularly a man and, and welcome to all of the men by the way as well you're very much part of this but there actually was a beautiful di um, a beautiful sensitive mm. dialogue yeah mm -hmm. that was silent respectful mm -hmm. Yeah, wasn't it? Because we, we were yeah. very conscious of that, and we met, we met beforehand downstairs in the in the mm -hmm. bistro, which was which was brilliant, um, because you could have a coffee, have a chat, before you know the ladies were were, were being um recorded, and we deliberately wanted Jennifer to be the person who was sitting in the seat, asking the questions. So when you see the film, t please take time and see that because it's mm -hmm. almost seamless. Even though there's been a lot of work behind the scenes, it's profound. It is. It, it you you're. It is life changing and life affirming at the same mm -hmm. time. This exhibition isn't about doom and, dis uh, doom and, and gloom. It no. actually is a celebration of life and the human condition and the resilience of 16 exceptional, glorious, sparkling ladies. Mm -hmm. Now, Jennifer, I want to bring you... Oh. <laughs> no, then. And some of them are here. Yep. And uh, you'll get a chance. You'll get a chance. And the irony of the whole thing is that on the night of the launch, there was a beautiful reception set up here for De from Deirdre and her staff here at Belfast Expose. And I have to acknowledge Belfast Expose mm -hmm. for hosting the first of this um, beautiful, monumental, and, mo and moving exhibition. Because it is going to tour. We haven't figured that out yet, where and when yet. Mm -hmm. But as we first met, we said we were going to have an exhibition. We said we were going to bring it to the highest level. And mm -hmm. we brought the, um, the ambition and the vision and the, not just the ask and demand to the um, elected representatives, but actually we delivered an ultimatum mm -hmm. in a form of a manifesto, which all of the ladies worked on. We worked together on that. Mm -hmm. And I remember saying to, to the ladies beforehand, we're not just here for the buns. Mm -hmm. We're here to deliver a message. And um, and I would be quite qu quiet and reserved normally. Really? Yes, but but not a, not a, Are like you sure? my sister my <laughs> sister really? Marion will attest that. Yeah, but 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 the reality is that when you are committed to a cause, mm. when you know that this is for the greater good, you will walk in hot coals. There is mm. no question about that. And I think we all felt the same. Mm -hmm. And I know I want to pay a particular tribute to Julianne here, who was the first trailblazer who prepared our way in Stormont and the Northern Ireland Assembly and really, really flagged it high. We then had the privilege to go up with, mm -hmm. with, um, with uh, Julianne, with Helen and with Cheryl. And we brought um, Professor Mark Lawler with us from the, the um, from Queens, who's the vice chair of the All Island Cancer Research Institute. And I deliberately asked him not to say anything. We weren't there to be guided or led by any particular person. We were there to represent the ladies. And Jennifer delivered a very moving presentation. And I did say that this was not a plea; it was an ultimatum. That that day, that day it was that very moving. The first day that we presented to the. Um, the chair and vice chair. The, to the vice chair, the chair and the vice chair of the the health committee. Um, that was the first time that I had seen the impact of my images combined with um, snippets of the, the their stories, these authentic stories. And in that room, you could have heard a pin drop, except for whenever we heard them blowing their noses, wiping away their tears and saying things like, oh my God, mm -hmm. whenever, the, and that's the same reaction that we're getting from, mm -hmm. from people as they sit and absorb mm -hmm. the stories from the women themselves. All we need is for people to listen and to uh, reach out and anybody here involved in any aspect of the medical profession or the healthcare sector, we need you to hear these, these women because the impact of how they are treated on both the women themselves and their families, it, it, well, my first word was unforgivable. Now, I'm not saying that everybody has the same experience yeah. of yeah. it, but you, to hear it so often and see the impact that it is having and the fact that there's not even a secondary breast cancer nurse um, there's, there's one, one in Northern there's Ireland. There's one now, yeah. paid, by one of the paid for by one of the charities mm -hmm. for primary breast cancer 
all there's you know even when they're being told bad news they've got somebody holding their hand hand in a box of tissue and somebody's somebody to um explain how things are mm. these women are, are told the news and they're sent on their way without so much as a phone call, That's phone right. number. And most of the ladies that, that you yep. have photographed as well, Jennifer, had been diagnosed with their secondary breast cancer during, lo during lockdown. Yes, so so the them. news was delivered either by phone, yep. or uh, and if it was delivered face to face, it was very cold. I'm, well, I'm reminded let, of, of, of let you'll me see tell that. You, you'll see was, that. Yeah, there, was, there, there is um, one of the, the, the women here um, that was diagnosed pre COVID. Yeah didn't even have the, the luxury, let's call it a luxury, because I'm telling you that if, if, if one of these women had a secondary breast cancer nurse in the room with them when they were told bad, uh, bad news, that would be a luxury. Mm -hmm. there's, there's one of the women in the, in the room this evening was uh, at her secondary breast cancer diagnosis in 2018, pre-COVID, her husband was with her the day before in, in the cancer um, unit and for I think something like five hours waiting around, you know, that the very next day. Um, because what they do is they've got to sit around half the day going for, to um, get a, a blood test or a scan or, or it's whatever. And she was called into the room to uh, what she thought was just another, um, uh, routine. Blood test, yeah. routine, right? And instead of that, it was an oncologist who informed her that the, the you know the next phase of her chemotherapy wasn't going to be going ahead, and it would be palliative care from now on because her breast cancer had spread. She asked some questions and was given some leaflets, and she was told and thankfully still here today, but she was, she asked about potentially how long she might have. And I hope that this is okay for me to be telling this in front of her. Anyway, she was told possibly two years. Now that girl had her husband sitting in the hospital corridor outside the room and the oncologist in the room had not even called her husband in or told her, maybe you'd like to bring your husband in. And she had to go out into the hospital corridor and tell her husband the news in the hospital corridor. Now I can tell you again that that's not an isolated type of of incident and and it really shocked me. And you know, if you put yourself in the situation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well, I can't because you know we yeah. can support all all these women and I can advocate for them but we are not them we are not in their shoes but my goodness surely to goodness the least that we can afford them is some kind of um, dignity dignity um, respect. empathy respect somebody at the end of a telephone most of the women involved the only person at the end of a telephone is a chemotherapy helpline, which could be anything from a receptionist to mm -hmm. a, a, um, a secretary, a doctor, a nurse mm -hmm. if, they're, if they're lucky, but they need specialist nurses yeah. to, that know what they've been going through, that, that can answer questions. I mean, so let's give you another example, right? So, whenever they're going through some of these chemotherapies, all these side effects, you can have terrible, terrible gum uh, uh, infections and problems in their jaw, for example, right? They need to be able to speak to somebody. To say, is this normal? You know, is yes. it, is it, what can I do to help? You know, and, but they don't have anybody. They don't have anybody. What strikes me, Jennifer, and I think, I think, for those of, for those of us who have had experiences of cancer, you know, amongst our families and our lives, that gentle hand holding, that gentle mm -hmm. support, mm -hmm. and sometimes things are left said on uh, mm -hmm. are left unsaid. Yeah. And I think what what this exhibition and this experience mm -hmm. provides all of us with is a wake up call mm -hmm. in terms of how we treat, how we connect, 
mm -hmm. we support our family and, and those in our community. And I think the other aspect as well is that our mother used to have this phrase, common sense is not so mm. common. It doesn't matter what degree mm -hmm. you have. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter what level of university, you know, um, uh, you know, um, qualification you've got. You know, th there, there's an element of dignity and, and compassion and engagement, which is really, really important. And that's something that, that mm -hmm. has been missing. I'm conscious, I'm conscious of our time now, and I, and I do want you to have time to witness yeah, this in action because it's really, really important. Mm -hmm. There is another opportunity on the, t on the 12th of May to come back and talk about the arts and the activism because um, art has a very key role to play. I mean, it is, it, it is a huge um, part of my life, mm -hmm. and a, a huge part of, of many of our lives, but the importance and the role of arts can never be under, underestimated. We're now in the, in the month of May. It's, it's the Mental Health Awareness Month. Mm -hmm. This exhibition is also part of the Northern Ireland Mental Health Arts Festival, and we will be exploring the whole idea about the impact on our emotional well-being as well. This exhibition is to be experienced, to be walked around, to listen, to come back, mm -hmm. to be still, watch it on your own, bring your family. It is education at its best. This exhibition is also supported by all of the learning cities across the island of Ireland and also because of the All Island Cancer Research Institute, which informs government policy, this exhibition is live action research. Mm -hmm. So don't tell me arts don't matter. Don't tell me that what you say, what you see, and what you hear and what you witness. We're in a gallery that is providing an opportunity to celebrate, but also remind us, we shouldn't have to be here. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't have to present this story these women should not have to be exactly using up the valuable energy that they have got to do this because i can tell you that none of these women involved in this project are doing it for themselves they will not benefit unless tomorrow when they go for their their next cancer appointment and they're all it's a constant it's an every day it's an every week it's an every month um, cycle of having chemotherapy, radiotherapy, surgeries, um, all sorts of things. And it just does not, uh, I'm waiting on scan results. I mean, they've got to wait like six mm -hmm. weeks sometimes on scan results. That's another six weeks of wasted of, of mm -hmm. treatment. They have no access to cancer trials. And some of the, you know, some of them just desperately want to be given the choice to go on a cancer trial and they're told no you can't well first of all in northern ireland they don't have access to them but secondly even if they were prepared to go over to london or somewhere like that for access um maybe be told no sorry um it might kill you i don't know it's going to do what well, and their, their response is i'm dying anyway why is it not my choice why is it not my choice and the number of times that I have felt that these women have not been listened to, and that's why I'm so, so passionate about them being heard, that it, it just, sorry, I do tend to go on, but, but one thing is that the, the phrase that I've heard more and more from people that have seen, that come up and spend time and actually listen to the actual voices up in that gallery, which I really, really hope that every single one of you here will go up now and, and um, appreciate, because some of these women are here, and if, and if you want to talk to them, talk to them. Ask them. Tell them that they matter, that you've heard them, and, and that you will do, everybody can do something. But the thing that I hear so often from people in the gallery is, I had no idea. And, and that is, you said it, mm -hmm. I said it, mm -hmm. we've all said it, until we actually listen to them. And everybody here has that opportunity tonight. And I'm very, very grateful. Yeah. And I also, Jennifer, before we end, I just want to acknowledge how are you feeling when you see your work in there? You're allowed to say it. I'm allowed to say it. Yes, that you are. OK, so, yeah, it has consumed me for the last six, seven months. Um, I have been truly humbled to have been trusted by every one of the women, not only with taking their photographs and telling their story, but actually to, to have listened and 
and they've cried in front of me and I said, how often do you cry? And invariably the answer will be hardly ever because they're staying strong for family and friends around them. Mm -hmm. And to be trusted, to, to, is it, is it really is a privilege. But yes, I feel very proud that, that it, we have got to this stage. I have to say, I'm very proud of my photography and the images that I've produced. But you know what? It had to, it, it, these women deserved to have the very, very best. And I just had to draw everything out of me to produce those images. And at times, uh, at times it broke me. And I, know, I after I the studio, I come out to the car and I, I was in pieces. And I had a couple of, uh, after a couple of glasses of... <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, bubbles, of yeah, bubbles. Quite bubbles, just a few yes. bubbles, yes. Uh, you know, and a few people have, have been on the end of phone calls. Where well, we I, made, we made have... that commitment, we made yes. that commitment. And I just uh -huh. want to acknowledge Julia Darcy for yes. introducing me to this lady and also the journey that we've shared. What I want to do is, mm -hmm. first of all, I want to acknowledge Lady Rob and, and yep. uh, Balfour's Exposed for the excellent um, opportunity here to exhibit in, in uh, this gallery. I want you to come upstairs and I want you to walk around the gallery. I want you to take time and take stock. And I would love you just to go in and, and just to listen mm -hmm. as well to the, to the audiovisual <sighs> as well. Yeah. I want to acknowledge the, um, Paul Marshall yep. for his role. Mm -hmm. And I want to acknowledge um, all of the ladies because without you, this is, you, this is, your, mm -hmm. this is your story and uh, you're, I would say in the 38 years that I've been involved in arts and culture this is the most I've said it before the most important exhibition the most important life affirming mm -hmm. experience yeah Julie, should we all right if then the audience were able to ask questions yes, yes of course so wait, what time yes. is it what time is it because my car parking somebody <laughs> Heather <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah okay so no. yes can we can Across does the it, road would anybody okay. like to ask any questions? Okay, oh, that's good. Would anybody like to ask any questions? Well, Julia, would you like to say something? Because you you have been there every step of the way. I've done a lot of calls, but I don't know if I'm not Uh-huh. <laughs> okay. Julie Ann. Um, no. No. What about you, Valerie? <laughs> no, don't 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 <laughs> let's Yeah. Wow. That was the first time. And really, it's not an awful lot to ask, is it? No. Is it does anybody, anybody have else? any? Yes, you're Jennifer's friend, uh huh? Yes. Oh, Jackie. Oh. Tonight is just 
not so great enough. Not me, not me for, for six. Yeah. And um, I'm willing to do whatever I I think I, I think that like our politicians, mm -hmm. we have to hold our medical professions to account, and we are mm -hmm. we are on a on a, a, a trailblazing mission to do that. Um, yeah, Marion. Oh, sorry, Marion. Oh, Charles. Charles. Charles sorry, and then Marion. Okay. <laughs> you're, you're much more important, Charles. I'm much more important than you. <laughs> sorry, Marion. <laughs> privilege to have been trusted with this and I said I think last week that these are perhaps the best photographs that I will ever take now I, I, I intend to continue taking photographs <laughs> but actually I wouldn't mind at all if I never took better photographs than what I have um, taken that you'll see upstairs um, because the, the night that I drove back from Rainey's house, mm -hmm. knew, knowing you that rang. this was going to happen, yeah. I felt totally overwhelmed because once I had made the offer and Ned said, yes, Jennifer would like, that's a great idea, would like you to do this. As I was driving home, I realised, oh my goodness, I have to make this work and I've got to make it work quickly. I've got to make it happen quickly um, because time is not on their side. And I, that is a fact of life, tragically. And so I felt initially overwhelmed. And, but to know that I've been able to, to produce some of, the, well, the best photographs I think that I will ever take, I'm, I'm happy with that. If I never take better photographs than this again, if I've done it for these amazing <coughs> women to, to raise their voices, then I'm, I'm good with that. Yeah. Anybody else? Marion? Yeah, Marion? I've been wearing the Umbro Choir Sister. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I just want to say very good to be here. Myself and my friend Catherine both Well, Maureen, I suppose the compassion that mm -hmm. we were talking about, that, that, you know, for those that are working in the, in the medical we profession. That's, that's quite right. There is a canyon. It's not just a, a cavity. There's a canyon between the moment of diagnosis and the time that these women um, will inevitably need end-of-life care. There is a chasm in the middle that needs to be filled, starting with care and compassion, empathy and compassion, secondary breast cancer nurses, they need to count, they need to be, be counted, included in an audit, and they just need people around them at the end of the phone, somebody that will actually say, we hear you, what is it that you need? I just need to know if this 
um, if there's something that can be done with this pain or I'm feeling or my, my, I've got a terrible abscess in my, in my jaw, what can be done? They have nobody. It's not very gentle because she's here firsthand. Yes. It, to GP calls that aren't going out. Yeah. And what I'm to assess and, and carry out observations yep. of patients that are vulnerable. Uh -huh. And it's, it's horrendous. Yep. And at a time that they need it most, everything, if, if they were prime, if they were ever diagnosed with having had primary breast cancer, there's, there, it's not, that's not a prerequisite. There, some of them are diagnosed de novo, which means um, immediately a secondary breast cancer. So it, they're told at that time that it has already, um, it has already spread. But at the time, that they are diagnosed with secondary breast cancer, everything that was available to them, support groups, cancer nurses, oncologists, dare I say it, and I yes. know we're being recorded, yes. that actually understand and don't treat, There's, these women want to understand their treatment and they can't even ask questions of their oncologists without being made to feel, oh, well, what do you need to know that for? Some of them have, and I hope it's okay for me to say this, a lot of them have actually, because the oncologists don't actually take the time to talk to them, they are asking for their own medical files, their own medical records, so that they can look through them themselves and understand and ask the right questions. Now, for me, you know, they, they, and that's just coming from their experience. There, there are women who wouldn't have the courage to, to say boo to, to anybody in the medical profession. And so they don't, you know, they're not going to be asking the questions that perhaps they need. Or they say, right, thanks very much for your time, and off they go which I can remember doing in a, an appointment one time whenever um, a, a consultant leant across the desk to me and he said, um, Mrs. Willis, you've had a stroke, now it's time to get over it. Away you go. And that wasn't what had happened at all. And that, that experience of mine showed me, really led it in after months of toing and froing and MRIs and all the rest of it, that actually they're not doctors are not god they don't get everything right and he this the consultant certainly did not listen so as soon as cheryl started to tell me her her experiences i could identify with what she's um was telling me and i think there's you know i i'm i'm right in saying am i that it, it there are a lot of the negativity arises in oncology. Is that, yeah, okay. Uh, so they're not listened to, they want to be heard, they want to have things explained, they want to know why they're on a particular protocol of, of treatment or why that treatment, that protocol lasts for 18 weeks instead of six weeks or all, you know, those things. But none of that is explained to them. And, and I suppose we have to change the culture. And I suppose yes. tonight is about being seen and heard mm -hmm. the, through the artist's eyes, through yep. the lens of an artist, mm -hmm. but also through the ladies and through the families that are experiencing this. Yep. And if you want to witness and you want to affect change, then come upstairs with us. Join us in, uh -huh. in looking at this exhibition, I'm standing take, face yeah. to face. I'll be taking notes. And Who also, also listening. It's really, really important to listen because this will affect change in, in how we interact with families, mm -hmm. loved ones, colleagues. Sorry, there's a question you wanted to ask Jennifer's cousin. Yeah, no. Um, it's just no. Uh, last week when I was here, um, yes, the images are, are very powerful. But when you go up stairs, you walk with what has been left with me is, is There's six or seven of them here now, I think so. And, and, and some are watching online as well. Mm -hmm. Because I have been 
questioning other people and mm -hmm. I will continue to question people in medical professions mm -hmm. when I visit them other times because mm -hmm. this is horrendous. Mm -hmm. And I am sorry and okay. we are in such a mm -hmm. And that's why this expression should be important. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know, my privilege was um, the way I contacted her. And she said, What about this exhibition? And I was going, but I know well I know well enough enough. Love enough to know me to know yeah. that it's important. Yeah. I mean, might as well give in early, right? Exactly. And, and Jennifer <laughs> and some of the women came to me within five minutes. I went, absolutely, a hundred percent yes. Not only was it great art, and I had to tip my cap to you. I uh -huh. an artist myself, but it it was just I learned within five minutes so much mm -hmm. what is happening. I didn't know that at all. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that earlier on, and it's so important. There's so little people know about it. So it's important that you've done that. Mm -hmm. And I would like to close this. Yes. Uh, and I would like to say thank you to you, Noel. Thank you. And you, Jennifer, as the artist, absolutely amazing. But also thank you to the ladies for really engaging mm -hmm. and participating. Thank you. There's yeah. wine. Do you want to serve a wee bit of oh, wine? Oh, there's a wee bit of wine. Yes, wine. plenty of wine. And I have some leaflets. Feel free to bring your wine upstairs. Yeah, yeah. And I'm...